Good morning. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our heritage.org website. I uh, would ask our guests in-house if you'll be so kind to check that cell phones have been silenced as we begin. It's always appreciated. And, of course, we will post the program on the Heritage homepage following the presentation for everyone's future reference. Introducing our special guest and hosting our program is Dr. Niall Gardner, director of our Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom. He is also a former aide to Lady Thatcher. He has worked at the heart of Washington policy now for over a decade and is considered a leading expert on the U.S.-U.K. special relationship. He is a regular contributor to the London Daily Telegraph and appears frequently on American and British television. He received his doctorate in history from Yale University. Please join me in welcoming Niall Gardner. Niall. Uh, thanks very much, uh, John. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation. Uh, Dr. Eliza Philby begins her book, God and Mrs. Thatcher, with the statement, I doubt many people have uttered the words God and Mrs. Thatcher in the same sentence. Today, we often think of religion as having little influence on modern British politics. Yet religion played a crucial role in the formation and evolution of the politics of Britain's first woman prime minister, Margaret Thatcher. Growing up in Grantham, the young Margaret Roberts' life revolved around Methodism. Her father was a lay preacher, and the family rigorously attended church services and prayer meetings. The austere religion of her childhood undoubtedly affected the politics of her later life. Lady Thatcher has been described as the most religious prime minister since Gladstone, the living embodiment of the Protestant work ethic. Indeed, we cannot underestimate the religious faith of political leaders, as Lady Thatcher noted in a 1977 speech to young conservatives. Our religion teaches us that every human being is unique and must play his part in working out his own salvation. So whereas socialists begin with society and how people can be fitted in, we start with man, whose social and economic relationship are just part of his wider existence. Because we see man as a spiritual being, we utterly reject the Marxist view, which gives pride of place to economics. Thatcher's faith, based on her religious values, focused on rolling back socialism, ending communism, and resurrecting Britain. Margaret Thatcher was shaped by centuries of British religious beliefs and traditions, and in turn, she shaped the history of her great nation. How and why she did so is the focus of Dr. Philby's lecture today. Dr. Eliza Philby is a lecturer in modern British history at King's College, London, having received her doctorate at Warwick University. She runs her own business, Grad Train, which helps graduates prepare for the job market. Described as refreshingly original and a thoroughly researched and thoughtful study, God and Mrs. Thatcher is her first book. Please welcome Dr. Eliza Philby. Okay, good morning everyone and thank you for being here. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the Heritage Foundation and the Margaret Thatcher Centre for Freedom for inviting me to come talk to you today, and especially Niall Gardner for that wonderful introduction. Margaret Thatcher always used to say, when she stepped off the plane in America, you could smell freedom. And I stepped off the plane yesterday and I could perhaps not smell freedom, but I could certainly feel the sunshine um, because I left London and it was grey, dark and dull. So the Washington heat is um, certainly welcome. Mrs. Thatcher declared in 1981, economics is the method, the object is to change the soul. These words seem to perfectly summarise her bold approach her values and her commitment to politics. The Iron Lady was, of course, famous for her conviction, her resolve, for not kowtowing to her critics nor her enemies, for showing bravery and adversity at a time when those around her, mostly men, had none. Margaret Thatcher is not short on biographers, but while many have analysed how Thatcher recreated Britain and her role on the world stage, my starting point for God and Mrs. Thatcher was how did Britain create Margaret Thatcher? In this speech, I want to really cover four points. The first of which is the Methodist origins of Margaret Thatcher's politics, and specifically the influence of her lay preacher father, Alfred Roberts. 
Secondly, I want to talk briefly about her personal devotion and her devoutness and the way in which she sought solace and comfort from prayer in times of adversity. Thirdly, I want to make a, some sort of remarks on the way in which in British politics and as well as it did in American politics in the 1980s, how religious and political conservative, conservatism was aligned and was confronted by a challenge of equal force and of equal strength and alliance between liberal Christianity and left-wing wing politics. The chief opposition that Mrs Thatcher faced on the domestic political scene was not from the Labour Party, but the Tory party's old ally, the Church of England, the established church. Fourthly, I want to end my speech by making some brief, but I think pertinent comments of the way in which religion and politics interacts very differently in Britain than it does in America. According to Margaret Thatcher's press secretary, Bernard Ingham, Margaret Thatcher had five key qualities as a leader. First of all, ideological security. She knew what she wanted to achieve. Secondly, moral courage. And as her father said, a determination never to follow the herd. Thirdly, constancy. Fourthly, an iron will to stick to the task. And finally, and I think perhaps most importantly for any would-be politician, she did not wish to be loved. When on one occasion her husband Dennis Thatcher heard Bernard Ingham give this speech on Thatcher's key qualities, he offered a corrective. You should have a sixth, Bernard, he said, for she has a deep religious faith. God and Mrs Thatcher, my book, essentially argues that it was Margaret Thatcher's religious faith and background that was the source of these five qualities of her leadership. The moral constancy, the ideological um, security, the iron will to stick to the task, and a willingness not to be loved. Margaret, Th Ma Margaret Thatcher's faith is not something that has generally been examined, neither by her bi biographers nor those that have um, offered commentary on her time in office. Most tend to source her politics, as they do most of the conservatism in the, that dominated the 1980s, from the resurgence in free market economics from the mid-1970s, the works of Milton Friedman, Frederick von Hayek, etc., etc. But as one of her leading advisers once said, Margaret Thatcher was a woman of beliefs, not ideas. And it's the beliefs of Methodism that I think owe us, afford us, show us the greatest source of Margaret Thatcher's politics. Our lives revolved around Methodism, so said Margaret Thatcher on her upbringing in 1920s, 30s Grantham, a provincial town should you ever wish to, wish to visit in the East Midlands. The Roberts were an extremely devout family. They would say grace before and after every meal. They were indeed teetotalers and only kept a dusty old bottle of sherry in the house for guests, a fact which the drinking-loving Dennis Thatcher found a great frustration when it came to meeting his in-laws. Her family would attend chapel not once, twice, but three times every Sunday, whilst board games, sewing and newspapers were strictly forbidden. They were strict Sabbatarians. Margaret Thatcher later said, for us, it was rather a sin to enjoy yourself by entertainment. Life was to work and do things. And I do believe that that was said, not without a hint of frustration. Thatcher's Grantham, with its network of town governance, charities, philanthropists and local businesses, as well as Finken Street Methodist Chapel, where her family worshipped, was Britain in its pre-statist era. And indeed, it was not a world away from Ronald Reagan's religious upbringing at the Disciples of Christ Church, Illinois. Nor, for that matter, was it a world away from that other female politician and daughter of John Wesley, Hillary Rodham Clinton, whose upbringing in Park Ridge, Illinois, was, of course, Republican and Methodist. Clinton was born into a Methodist Republican household, 
but as a teenager would go in the opposite direction to Margaret Thatcher, embracing Methodism with a social justice agenda under the tutelage of her youth minister, Don Jones. But I do believe that the parallels between Margaret Thatcher's upbringing and specifically Ronald Reagan's are an important reason for their personal affinity. And I think one of the reasons why Margaret Thatcher had such an understanding, appreciation for American religion, civil society and its governance. Every Sunday, the young Margaret Roberts would sit in the pews of Finken Street Methodist Chapel. And up there, in the pulpit, was Alfred Roberts, her father, the chief influence in her life standing over six foot three inches tall with shock white albino hair. Sort of, if you can imagine him as a sort of Old Testament prophet. What is interesting is not so much that her father was a lay preacher, but the content of his sermons. And thankfully, a collection of those sermons were kept, dating between 1941 to 1945, by Mrs. Thatcher and are now housed in her personal archive in Cambridge. Appropriately enough for a Methodist, the sermons show an, an emphasis on individual salvation and the Protestant work ethic, as well as an appreciation on the virtues of thrift and liberty. Indeed, Thatcher later said, before I ever read a page of Milton Freeman or Alan Waters, I just knew that thrift was a virtue and profligacy was a vice. Contained within her father's sermons are also, rather fascinatingly, instructions to prospective preachers and would-be leaders. Her father advised that if you want to become a leader, it demanded absolute conviction. He also advised that it would be a slog. Your task demands and deserves sheer hard work sweat of brains and discipline of soul. We cannot in any way um, deny that Thatcher had that in droves. Perhaps what is most striking about her father's sermons though was the way in which he applied his faith to his politics. Be it on liberty, God-given liberty, understanding of trade unions or free trade. Her father maintained, just as there was no tariff, I quote, on God's grace, nor should there be one on consumer goods. This doctrinal legitimation of the invisible hand was one, of course, his daughter would enunciate with equal passion 40 years later. Later on, writing in 1951, her father, just as the Labour government were putting into place a fully universalised healthcare system, warned the congregation of Finken Street, not to put too much faith in temporal power, but spiritual power, i.e. greater temporal intervention is a threat to Christianity. Nor was her father much impressed with the church's involvement in social justice, which he believed turned the church, the house of God, into a glorified discussion group, I quote. In fact, Margaret Thatcher would almost echo her father's words in 1988 when she said, Christianity is about spiritual redemption, not social reform. According to her father, the real threat of the modern world was not poverty, but affluence. And indeed, he believed that it was the temptations of affluence that should and should be where the church's emphasis should lie. Tellingly, he also believed speculation in the realm of finance was, in effect, institutionalised gambling. In the wake of the Wall Street crash, that was perhaps a view that many Methodists felt. Indeed, the struggle to how to morally square the free market with the increasing materialism and globalisation of finance was something his daughter, Margaret Thatcher, as Prime Minister, would grapple throughout her premiership. However, back in 1975, just as Mrs. Thatcher seized the leadership of the Conservative Party, it was not to Frederick von Hayek, nor to Adam Smith or Milton Friedman, upon which she based her popular appeal, 
but the teachings of her Methodist father. Margaret Thatcher drew on the tales of self-reliance, hard work and moral restraint as the sober antidote for Britain, then drowning under the constraints of excessive bureaucracy, industrial strife and economic decline. The Iron Lady positioned herself as the hard-working Methodist woman from provincial England, armed with a handbag and conviction, determined to kick the ruling elite into shape. And indeed, what is fascinating, I believe, in 1975, this was a view that was confirmed in a report by the US Embassy in London for the State Department, in which they labelled Margaret Thatcher as the genuine voice of a beleaguered bourgeoisie, quintessential suburban matron and frightfully English to boot. Strangely enough, when I started interviewing Margaret Thatcher's aides, ministers and confidants, the standard response I got was, Margaret Thatcher never talked about religion, never heard her mention it once. She wasn't religious. Going in search of Margaret Thatcher's faith, I found was a bit like going in search of Sisters and Cain's rosebud incredibly frustrating and almost impossible. At some points, I did start to wonder whether there was enough material for this book. But I soon came to the conclusion that they, and perhaps I, had conceived a very narrow view, and perhaps almost secular view, of what faith actually is, and how faith manifests itself. It's not something that purely manifests itself in prayer. It's not something that is always articulated openly. It is not always something confined to the heart nor the head, but manifests itself in personality, language, outlook, style. So therefore, when speaking of Margaret Thatcher's religious origins, one cannot simply consider her personal faith nor devoutness, but her class, her principles, her values, her language, her style. If Thatcher was a conviction politician, then at the root of her politics were her religious political values. These were assumed and accepted precepts about God, man, and those applied to the political sphere. Having said that, Margaret Thatcher was a woman of intense personal piety, even though the British public never knew it. The habit of Sunday worship never left her, According, indeed, to the rector of the local church in Chequers, the Prime Minister's weekend residence, Margaret Thatcher attended more often in her first two years of premiership than in all previous Prime Ministers put together. The incumbent, Reverend David Horner, however, was under strict instructions from Dennis Thatcher to keep his sermon short. Padre, most of us know what the Sermon on the Mount is about. We don't need you to explain it to us. Twelve minutes is your lot. Margaret Thatcher, too, was a keen reader of religious works. One aide remembers on encountering her bookshelves that there was more Bible than Burke. They included C.S. Lewis's wartime lectures, Mere Christianity, which she had heard on the wireless radio in her youth, the collected sermons of John Wesley, as well as books on Jewish ethics. And indeed, one of her closest religious allies was indeed the chief rabbi, who staunchly defended her policies against the Church of England in the 1980s. In 1988, Margaret Thatcher undertook the bold ambition to read all 39 books of the Old Testament, which she liked to quote at length to her civil servants. She too was a particular fan of American Catholic theologian Michael Novak. In the late 1980s, she invited him to Downing Street, where she proudly presented him with her annotated copy, The Spirit of Democratic Capitalism. What appealed to Thatcher was Novick's contention that the democratic capitalist system was not just an economic system, nor was it politically, uh, morally neutral, but intensely moral, one that encouraged both individual virtue and mutual co cooperation. In Novick's fine words, capitalism Accepting human sinfulness rubs sinner against sinner, making even dry wood yield a spark of grace. As historian Gertrude Himmelfarb has correctly pointed out, Thatcher was not an individualist. She would, did not have an atomized view of the autonomous self as the alternative to state collectivism, but stressed the social responsibility that came with individual freedom. <clears throat> 
In terms of the Methodist commitment to work and thrift, Thatcher always practised what she preached. She used to rage privately against bankers' bonuses, as excessive and crude. She didn't like spending money, either hers or other people's, and especially not taxpayers'. She famously had the swimming pool at Chequers, which had been actually donated by Richard Nixon. She had it, um, she, she had, she had it um, drained when she found out that it cost $8,000 a year to keep going. This was a woman who lived by her mother's standards. Her personal piety was not something she lauded nor promoted, but her daughter Carol Thatcher has hinted how important particularly prayer was at times of profound stress, particularly during the Falklands War. And her assistant, Cynthia Crawford, has also recounted on the night of the IRA Brighton bomb, while they were both holed up in a dormitory at the local police station, Margaret Thatcher pondered to Crawford, this was not the day I was meant to see. She then asked Crawford, who was Jewish, to sit with her and recite the Lord's Prayer. Later that week, Margaret Thatcher wrote to head head of communications, Harvey Thomas, confiding, it would have been difficult to have gone through the last weekend without a very strong faith. In actual fact, before joining the Conservatives, Harvey Thomas had spent 15 years organising stadium tours for Billy Graham and indeed had been charged with bringing the same evangelical fervour to the Conservatives' election campaign in 1979. Speaking on Margaret Thatcher's belief, Harvey was certain. Good, straightforward, practical evangelicalism. It was quite a driving force in her mind. For Margaret Thatcher, the story of the Good Samaritan, helping an unknown battered man lying helpless in the road, demonstrated the supremacy of individual charitable virtue over enforced state taxation. As she famously said in those uncompromising words, no one would have remembered the Good Samaritan if he had only had good intentions. He had money as well. In her view, the Christian duty to love thy neighbor could not be manufactured by politicians nor generated through taxation, but only through individual virtue. Her understanding was, with more money of our own in our pockets, we would all be transformed into Good Samaritans. We would not walk by on the other side, nor would we need state-imposed traffic lights to guide us there. This was very, this stood in stark contrast to what the Church of England, in response, gave to Margaret Thatcher's gospel. The Anglican leadership, for the Anglican leadership, the parable meant something quite different, namely the universality of human fellowship and the scriptural justification for the indiscriminate redistribution of wealth. As one bishop made clear, the point of the story is not that the Good Samaritan had money, but that others had passed on by the other side. At a time when the Labour Party endured a period of self-inflicted paralysis, it was indeed the established church which rather surprisingly and often willingly stepped up to be the unofficial opposition to defend what they considered to be Britain's Christian social democratic values forged in the aftermath of the Second World War. And in fact, it had been Archbishop William Temple, wartime Archbishop William Temple, that had first coined the term the welfare state. From the pulpit to the picket line, in the Lords and in the inner cities, the Anglican clergy routinely condemned neoliberal theory and practice as being fundamentally at odds with the Christian principles of fellowship, interdependence and peace. And strangely enough, particularly in the context of British politics, in the 90s, you had, in 1980s, you had a convergence between religious and political conservatism embodied in Margaret Thatcher and liberal Christianity and progressive politics on the other. The origins of this religious political divide could be, of course, dated back to the social, political and cultural upheavals of the 1960s and, of course, had their parallels in the United States, but only reached their climax in the 1980s. 
Here in America, with a more religiously devout populace and a religiously infused political culture, it is perhaps at least more expected. But in Britain, the idea of a prime minister preaching on the true meaning of the gospel and the Archbishop of Canterbury preaching on the morality of taxation was a relatively novel and surprising situation. Interestingly, the church's criticisms bothered Mrs. Thatcher. She confided in a letter to one of her advisers in 1988, the church keeps on saying we must relieve poverty. And when we do, they say we're making everyone materialistic. In an unexpected stroke in 1988, she summoned seven bishops to a private meeting at Chequers. It was not a success. Thatcher proceeded to launch into a sermon on the harmony between Christianity and liberty. Midway through, the Bishop of Chester, who was a very unassuming, rather polite evangelical, piped up. I'm afraid you misunderstand, Prime Minister. Christianity is not about freedom, it's about love. This interjection barely interrupted her flow. Although the meeting ended in joint prayer, it had not been a meeting of minds. Margaret Thatcher was a conviction politician whose combative style and Manichaean-like approach was in many senses more familiar to American political culture than British. By and large, the British prefer their prime ministers to be pedestrian rather than charismatic characters. One need only compare the palatial grandeur of the White House to the pokey flat above number 10 Downing Street to illustrate this point. The post of prime minister, curtailed as it is by parliamentary chamber and constitutional monarch, facilitates the British dislike and distrust of strong leadership. Yet Margaret Thatcher and, of course, Winston Churchill are one of the few occupiers of number 10 to have subverted this tradition. Crudely speaking, whereas America has a secular state but a largely devout public, Britain has a Christianised state and a predominantly secular electorate. Would-be prime ministers have always been wary of delving too deeply into religious matters for fear of alienating the electorate. In the 1980s, while America saw a revival of a moral conservative movement, no such parallel development took place in Britain. In Parliament, legislation pertaining to personal morality such as abortion, homosexuality and divorce were deemed conscience issues, which members of Parliament were given a free vote and a free reign, not subject to party whip. Thatcher may have been a Christian, but her faith was never moralistic. She took, of course, an old-fashioned view on sexual morality, but ultimately saw such issues as a matter of personal conscience rather than ones that should be subject to regulatory control. And despite ministers' public protestations against the permissive culture, the Conservative government did very little to, lib to reverse the liberalising legislative reforms in the 1960s, and in some cases actually travelled further down the liberalising road, especially on divorce, homosexuality, and particularly in respect to combating the AIDS crisis, in which the British government actually gave the most, um, developed the most liberal and successful response to the AIDS pandemic. One area, of course, where Thatcher's faith did profoundly shape her outlook was in her approach to the great cause of the age, the Cold War. Like Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II, Margaret Thatcher believed that the fight against atheistic communism was, in every sense, a crusade. She herself would play a crucial part in the propaganda offensive against the Eastern Bloc. Early on in her premiership, her speech writer her an expert on Eastern Europe, George Urban, advised her on the need to adopt a tone of moral outrage rather than cool reason. Urban's view, one with which Thatcher readily concurred, was that the West in the 1970s had lacked the self-confidence of the Soviets and had been shy in asserting its values, particularly on democracy and freedom. Urban's idea of an ideological counter-offensive certainly appealed to Thatcher. She always dismissed the notion that there was any moral equivalence between the USSR and the West. 
More than any other British leader since Winston Churchill, Thatcher was willing to elevate the Cold War into one about ideas and values, a position she most openly demonstrated in her unwavering support for solidarity in Poland. In 1983, Thatcher used the occasion of her acceptance speech for the Winston Churchill Foundation Award in Washington to assert that the Cold War was one chiefly about ideas, not weapons. You in the West, said an Hungarian poet, have a special duty because you are free. That freedom is both a blessing and a burden, for it makes you spiritually responsible for the whole of humanity. He was right. For if we do not keep alive the flame of freedom, that flame will go out, and every noble idea will die with it. It is not by force of weapons but by force of ideas that we seek to spread liberty to the world's oppressed. For Thatcher, the fight against socialism at home and communism abroad was a fight for the sovereignty of liberty and individual free will. When victory finally came, Thatcher heralded it not as an economic nor even as a diplomatic success, but a moral victory. Capitalism was presented as the natural order, one from which both Britain and Eastern Europe had temporarily diverted, but had been steered back onto the right path once more. Delivering a speech to the Polish Senate in 1991, Margaret Thatcher declared, it is not just that capitalism works. It is not just that capitalism is morally right. What we have to recognize and proclaim with the most intense conviction is that capitalism works because it is morally right. In this speech, Margaret Thatcher was echoing the words of her preacher father, Alf Roberts. In passion, principles, and practice, Margaret Thatcher never strayed too far from those Sundays she spent as a child in Finken Street Methodist Church, Grantham. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kirby, for a, a fascinating uh, talk, which um, brought back a lot of memories from my own days working with Lady Thatcher, including the, uh, the days when I shared an office with uh, Cynthia Crawford, uh, Crawfee, uh, Lady Thatcher's uh, personal assistant, who spent many decades with, uh, with the Iron Lady. And uh, I'd now like to open um, the discussion to the floor, but um, I, if I may, uh, I'll take the liberty of asking the first, uh, first question. And um, Eliza, um, I was wondering, uh, and I do apologize for the um, background drilling. Even in Washington, we have supporters of Jeremy Corbyn here disrupting the message. Um, and, uh, but uh, I was going to ask you, what really drove you to, to write this book? And um, how has Margaret Thatcher's life uh, influenced your own life? This is the most obvious demonstration of <laughs> fashion, sartorial influence. Please, please do. Uh, Thank you. Sartorial do, influence. Do, do, um, do um, I'll stand up. Sartorial influence is probably the most obvious. Um, but um, what drove me to, to write this book? I'm, I'm very interested in dying institutions that still have power. And and why that is. So my starting point actually wasn't Margaret Thatcher, but the Church of England. Um, I'm rather fascinated by this idea that an established church that has an ever declining uh, number of followers, that still has a fixed president, press, um, presence in the legislative chamber in the House of Lords, there's 26 bishops that sit in the House of Lords, um, and has and yet uh, a presence um, in every, you know, in every town, village, uh, and city across the land, certainly in England, what is it? Why is it that the Church of England still exists, and what is it for in this kind of secular, um, multicultural age? So that was my starting point. So my PhD was on actually the role of the Church of England in the politics of the 1980s, and the way in which and the and why it had had such a profound influence in in opposing Margaret Thatcher. But then I started to realize actually the, the, the more interesting story was Margaret Thatcher's religious influence and how, in a way, 
the more interesting question about Margaret Thatcher is not how she recreates Britain, but how did Britain create Margaret Thatcher? And in fact, actually, she is a product of a dying non-conformist heritage and a product of a liberal, not a conservative, a liberal father. So she almost kind of, you know, that, that, that was really fascinating to me because of all the biographies I'd read about Margaret Thatcher, not, no one had seriously looked at her religious beliefs. No one had seriously looked at um, Grantham and what growing up in Grantham had been like and how it influenced her. Um, and I thought, well, hang on, there's something interesting here, which is we have a Methodist, a nonconformist, head of a cons the Conservative Party. She's promoting a kind of nonconformist liberalism that is more familiar to the 19th century than the late 20th. Um, and she's being opposed by the Church of England that has historically been alliance with the Conservative Party. That's a real disjuncture that is an interesting phenomenon. And, and the, the conflict between church and state in the 1980s was a theological one. It was, a th a, rather than a political um, scrap, it was a theological, a serious theological debate about, you know, the, the nature of liberty, the meaning of free will, um, and, and, and how one should interpret the Bible and how it could be and should be applied to politics. Um, and I thought that it's in the 1980s you get these two institutions that historically, you know, the Tory party actually grew out of the Church of England. The relationship between the Church of England and the Tory party is as close historically as the Labour Party and the trade unions. And yet, by the 1980s, the church has gone to the left politically and the Conservative Party has gone to the right, causing an irrevocable breach um, uh, which you know almost kind of completely undermines the historical alliance that had been in there, been in place for two hundred years. So that that those kind of that all that dynamic really interested me. And then I started. I found her father's sermons, which were you know fascinating because I suddenly realised actually what we now know as Thatcherism was being said, articulated, preached by a low lay preacher in you know interwar provincial Grantham, and. I found I found that fascinating, and and things you know started to come up that Margaret Thatcher had actually met um, the Archbishop of Canterbury whilst being at Oxford, and she booted him out of the Conservative Party because of his, I quote, frivolous attachment to politics. You know, so these sort of these these great encounters um, started to sort of emerge through the archives, and I thought this is a, this is what this is essentially the story of of the declining influence of religion in British British politics. And Thatcher embodies that um, that shift. So that's a long answer to your interesting question. Yes, no, thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, we'll take a question from the um, from the audience. And please do identify yourself uh, and any institutional affiliation as well when you ask a question. Uh, Luke. Hi, uh, Luke Hoffie with the Heritage Foundation. Thank you for the very interesting discussion. I was wondering, in the course of your research, if you came across any um, interesting aspects about how Lady Thatcher viewed other faiths and how that might have shaped um, any of her thinking. Um, I know, for example, that um, she is still held today in very high regard in the Middle East, especially in Saudi Arabia. And you know, she during her time as Prime Minister, she um, really deepen the, the UK-Saudi relationship, for example, in, in, another, in a number of um, areas and aspects. So I was wondering if you came across any, anything uh, along those lines. Thank you. Um, great question. Um, in terms of, um, so there's a two-part two part answer, really. The first is, is that um, the most important diplomatic event happens in 1982 in Britain. It's the first papal visit since the Reformation, Pope John Paul comes to Britain. And of course, six weeks before he does, Thatcher declares war on Argentina, a deeply Catholic country. And there is a huge fracas, so, you know, should the, should the visit be canceled? Should, should it happen, should it not happen? Um, the eventual compromise is that state representatives agree to stay out of the entire visit. Um, but. That's an incredibly important moment because up until that point, 
Catholics had been. I'm sorry, I haven't yeah, stood up. Have too, uh, up until that point, um, you know, the, the anti Catholicism ha was deeply ingrained in British society, long standing tradition of sectarianism in places like Liverpool, Glasgow. Um, and there was a deep anxiety about the papal visit because it may, there was, it was feared that it would um, fan the flames of, of, of kind of anti Catholicism. And what's interesting is that. Um, that happens under her watch. Thatcher had a deep respect and reverence for Catholicism, the Catholic Church, and particularly Pope John Paul, particularly Pope John Paul, um, obviously because of his stance during the Cold War. So, so there was an, a nice sort of a kind of a clear affinity with Catholicism. Um, I would also reference her clear affinity to Judaism because she was MP for Finchley, which had a very high proportion of um, Jewish constituents. She came to that constituency in 1959 at a time when the Liberal Party was actually threaten, threatening to win that constituency seat from the Conservatives because of accusations of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism had been uh, a thread throughout the Conservative Party. Within Finchley, she immediately curbed, um, put to bed the, the Liberal threat by making um, uh, you know, friends and, and connections and deeply ingraining herself within the Jewish constituents of, of, of Finchley. That sparked a lifelong connection, association, respect for the Jewish faith. And as I said, and I referenced, her kind of chief kind of spiritual ally was the, the chief rabbi, Emmanuel Jacobitz, who um, defended her openly against the Church of England. Um, she always referenced him as her spiritual soulmate. Um, they had a great affinity. And she, as I said, read a lot of Jewish eth um, books on Jewish ethics. And she always spoke of a, the Judeo-Christian values. She would join the two, Judeo-Christian values. Um, and that's quite commonplace to do that in America, I believe, but not so much in Britain. So that, again, like Catholicism, Judaism in Britain, there's a long history of, you know, of being, an, being outsiders. The 1980s, what's interesting is when the Jewish constituents of Britain start voting Conservative rather than Labour. And that's partly because of the Labour Party stance on Israel um, f uh, changes uh, in the 1970s but, and becomes incredibly anti-Israeli. But it's also because the Conservative Party warms to and appeals to, makes explicit appeals to the Jewish co constituents. Um, in terms of Islam... One interesting event that happens under Margaret Thatcher's watch is the Satanic Verses controversy and the fatwa against Salman Rushdie. And what's striking about the Conservative Party's response, the Conservative government's response, is that they, the Archbishop of Canterbury calls for an extension of the blasphemy law to include not just Christianity but all faiths which seems totally bizarre, but that was, that was the, the Archbishop of Canterbury's response. Margaret Thatcher completely, and Douglas Hurd, who was Home Secretary, completely saw it as a freedom of speech issue. And so didn't really make any comment, if you like, on Islam and the way in which it may or may not curb individual expression and freedom of speech. There's no sort of, because it was, you know, there was no, there's no great, I didn't find any great ev um, evidence for um, either appreciation of, great understanding of, or denigration of Islam. Um, but I think it's interesting that the Satanic Verses was the controversy, the fatwa was dealt with in a very sort of, this is, a, this is an issue about freedom of speech. Um, and I, th I think that... Um, she always, I mean, she always maintained Salman Rushdie was not a massive fan of Margaret Thatcher. And in, indeed, she is vilified in the Satanic Verses as much as Mohammed. Um, she, she always ensured um, and supported his right to protection. Um, so, so, yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, gentlemen, right to the back there. Sorry, thank you. Um, so uh, one of a famous quote from Margaret Thatcher is that uh, Europe was shaped by history and the United States by philosophy. 
And then you mentioned earlier that there, in the United States we have a secular government but a religious citizenry. And in England it's a Christian con uh, institutionalized country with a very secular population. How does, has this influenced the divergence, uh, if you will, of the conservative and the Republican Party ideologically under the 21st century, in your opinion? Um, great question. Um, just to add to the quote about, um, I haven't heard, I ha I've never heard that quote actually, of the contrast between um, Europe. She, in 1989, 1989, when it was the, the anniversary of the French Revolution, she said that, um, why should we be celebrating the French Revolution? It only resulted in a lot of bloodless, uh, blood, uh, bloodless bodies and a tyrant. And I think that, you know, that, that was said in Paris, actually, on the, the anniversary of the French Revolution. And I think that um, the, the question that you ask is, is really interesting because there's so, I mean, there's so much to say on this question. Um, I would, I think the issue about, and I'm going to speak predominantly about the Conservative Party, a, because I don't want to upset anyone, <laughs> but it's, I just feel on safer ground. But um, the thing about the Conservative Party is that it spent a long time trying to bury Margaret Thatcher. And, and in fact, when asked what was her greatest achievement, Margaret Thatcher said New Labour, because she recognised that the heir to Thatcher was Blair in terms of the adopt, kind of adopting her philosophy, adopting her politics. And the, while the Conservative Party, through internal, you know, ructions and internal sort of issues, took a long time to come to terms with satirism, and particularly being labelled, and again, this is partly the legacy of the Church of England and what it was saying in the 80s, being labelled as the nasty party being completely consumed in the murky, dirty world of, of capitalism, being homophobic, you know, being pro-family and therefore against single mothers, you know, the, all of that kind of um, asso negative associations with conservatism. It's taken them a long time to, to, to rid themselves of. Um, and, you know, that's why Cameron has been, has, has succeeded where his predecessors did not, because he has managed to detoxify the Conservative Party brand, essentially, um, whilst at the same time causing internal grievances at the grassroots. Um, but he has managed to, to a certain extent, detoxify the Conservative brand. And gay marriage, the passing of gay marriage, was an incredibly important way of doing that. Um, now, also, I think what's striking, and I think there's, there's something to say about the Republican Party as well here, is that, you know, Margaret Thatcher was very much of her time. She was a product of her time, even if her values are eternal. And the solutions and the wars and the issues and the message that was being and the answers that were given be given in the 1980s are not necessarily the answers to give now. And there's all sorts of reasons for that. I would say um, cultural attitudes are changing. Um, people's expectations of politics are changing. People's encounters with politics are changing. I mean, you know, Mrs. Thatcher's pre-internet, um, seriously pre-internet. It precedes the internet by, you know, 10 to 15 years in terms of mass consumption of the internet. Um, and one of the thing, one of the interesting things I think about politics now and the way that politics is going, is that and Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders and Jeremy Corbyn in the UK are products of this phenomenon. I think, is that in the age of mass information, what we're not, what we're getting is not disengagement um, or alienation from po politics, but disillusionment. People know more about more, and therefore they can see hypocrisy much quicker. It can be revealed, everything's recorded. So re hypocrisy is revealed much quicker. Therefore, they are looking towards and they are seeking solace in, are seeking faith in politicians who almost kind of tell it like it is. And are, are sort of seem seemingly free from hypocrisy 
that's questionable. But I also think that the, in the informa information age, people are finding more and more out about institutions and what institutions get up to. Okay, now Hillary is finding this obviously because of the, the emails and, and so forth. And therefore, what that does is not that institutions are up to anything worse than they were before, probably less, but people know more about the institution. So in Britain, people talk about an institutional crisis. And that institutional crisis has permeated the BBC because of the set of the revelations about um, sexual misdemeanors within the BBC in the 1970s and 80s. It's affecting the church, Church of England, same thing, tales of sec sexual abuse. It's affecting every institution in Britain, Parliament, because of the expenses scandal that happened a couple of years ago. People know more about what institutions are up to. The one institution in Britain that, that maintains credibility, public respect, the monarchy, because it's not in any way subject to any sort of institutional scrutiny, not really, not to the same degree that every other public institution is. And it's the one institution that still has ridden this institutional crisis. It went through, it had its moment in the 1990s when, when, uh, when Diana passed away. But it's interesting that in the era of mass information and mass scrutiny of institutions, the one institution that holds the public respect is the monarchy that doesn't actually undergo such scrutiny. So does that answer your question? No. <laughs> but it's an interesting diversion. And I think that from what I can see of American politics, and I'm very much an outsider, um, but an interested observer, is that American society is changing and it's becoming less religious. It's, um, you know, the, 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 the Spanish influence is becoming more profound. There is a deeper, um, I think, you know, there's a clear generational difference between what millennials expect, require, believe, understand, than perhaps older generations. And I think that this is something that both the Republican Party and the Democrat Party have got to contend with, really, is, is, is how America's going to transform in the next sort of 20 years. And I think also, you know, what was being said about America's global dominance in 2008, you know, is no longer the case now. I mean, with China slightly faltering, you know, the BRIC countries perhaps not as emerging as they once were, um, I think that America's kind of global position is, is quite secure, um, but is, is, is obviously constantly changing. And, you know, America's vision constantly, like, you know, all kind of political visions needs to be constantly updated and renewed. Um, but what I do find interesting is that the optimism and hope that surrounded Barack Obama's first election win um, hasn't really manifested itself. And I wonder where all that energy went, both, frustra uh, both in terms of frustration and optimism. Um, so I think these are all questions that I pose to you rather than can provide answers myself. Eliza, just actually in response to um, uh, to your comments earlier about um, Cameron and the, the sort of the modernisation uh, process, of, you know, within the Conservative Party. Um, don't you think that um, perhaps uh, you know Cameron was a bit more Thatcherite than one would have thought? In the in the recent election, he ran a campaign that was very much on the right. It's based on tax cuts a referendum on Europe, hardline policies on immigration, welfare reform, home ownership, right to buy. You know, a lot of the, um, the policies of the, of the sort of Thatcher era were uh, re resurfaced in this, this election campaign. And I was struck by the fact that Cameron Berry, Berry spoke about gay marriage, for example, which was opposed by a majority of his own mm. MPs during mm. the parliamentary vote. Um, and... Um, it seems that uh, you know Thatcherism is still alive and well in, in the Conservative Party, mm -hmm. despite having a leader who who does not describe himself as a Thatcherite. But if you look at the some of the main contenders to take over from David Cameron, uh, Boris Johnson, uh, Michael Gove, uh, George Osborne, the, these are people who would call themselves mm -hmm. Thatcherites. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and so I just wanted to you know to, to pose that, that question to you. I mean, do you, do you think that Thatcherism is 
is alive and well in the Conservative Party and, and perhaps making a, uh, you know, even a comeback post, mm. post Cameron? Mm. Um, the yes, and I think that's absolutely a um, pertinent point, is that the Conservatives won the election not on um, a sort of the, the sort of compassionate conservatism, but basically Thatcherism. Um, I would I would say though that it would be wrong to call it Thatcherism. I think that the Conservative Party, really since the 1970s, but you could date this right back to the 1950s actually, has been in constant tension between libertarians and conservatives. And the assumption of Margaret Thatcher as leader in 1975 represented the victory of the libertarian over the conservatives. And I, I will say that Margaret Thatcher, why she, why she was such a successful leader of her party and of the nation was the way she actually managed to straddle both aspects of conservative philosophy um, as a leader. Now, so when I talk about cons Cameron, Osborne, Boris Johnson. I would say that Osborne is a libertarian. I would say that Cameron is, is again, one of the reasons why he's been an effective leader is because he is able to um, straddle both libertarian and sort of conservative strands. And I think his dem his his justification for dr gay marriage and the way in which he expressed gay marriage as a conservative measure, in was incredibly. Uh, a good example of, of, of someone who is able to, uh, you know, present that. I think that um, I would so therefore I'd, I'd be hesitant about talking about them being Thatcherites. They may um, because I think this is a tradition that goes back to actually the split of the Liberal Party in the 1920s and 30s when a number of notable Liberals joined the Conservative Party, and. The rest of the kind of more socially democratic liberals joined the Labour Party, and um, I think that there has always been a tension in the 20th century between the more libertarian conservative members and a more kind of socially conservative um, uh, members in the party. And I think that to call them Thatcherites actually doesn't necessarily reflect the way that, on certain aspects. The debate has moved on, if you see what I mean. An interesting point. And uh, I'll, I'll take actually one last question. Um, Stephen Thompson in the back. Yep. Thank you for an enjoyable talk. In the beginning, you said um, regarding Lady Thatcher that when you spoke to a number of people that were close to her, they said she wasn't religious. But this is um, clearly not the case or you could not have written a book. <laughs> How do you account for this uh, divergence of opinion? Yes, I think um, I had a series of frustrating encounters where I'd be sort of begging people to tell me, you know, when did Margaret Thatcher mention God? Please tell me. Um, and as I, said, as I mentioned, I didn't really um, get... The, the, the juice, the, the, the interesting anecdotes, the, the sort of profound revelations that I thought I would. And as I sort of explained, what, why I think that is, is because people assume that a politician's faith has to be, uh, has to take a certain manifestation. So whether it be devoutness or whether it be prayer or whether it be, you know, I had a lot of politicians say, oh no, the religious prime minister was Tony Blair. And that's certainly true. Tony Blair was um, incredibly devout. He's still a devout man. He, he took religion very seriously, read the Bible, was an expert in early church history. But it was a very outward showing of faith. Now, faith manifests itself in different ways. And particularly if you are a cradle Christian and have grown up in a devout, as Mrs. Thatcher did, a devout household. So I argue that religion... And religious influence doesn't just manifest itself in, you know, whether you go to church every Sunday, but in your 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 values, your language, your style, your um, your your class. You know, religion is so inherently connected with class in Britain; it's insane. 
Um, you know, so it manifests it, how it manifests it to itself in different ways. And so when I talk about Mrs. Thatcher's theopolitical values, they weren't always articulated in terms of the Bible or in terms of religion. They're often, um, but they are inherently religious because that's where she got them all from. That's the origins of her values. And so when people talk about Mrs. Thatcher being a conviction politician, she's only a conviction politician because she comes from, you know, a place of conviction. Um, she comes from a home in which her father, you know, was an intensely religious man. She herself was a preacher, a lay preacher, whilst a student at Oxford. So Methodism is her centre point. It's her language. It's her... It's the source of her values. It's the source of her behaviour, her attitude towards money, her attitudes towards, you know, um, work, cleanliness. You know, there's certain numerous tales of Margaret Thatcher, you know, sweeping the floor and, you know, try and, and deciding, you know, policy initiatives at the same time. You know, she was obsessed with cleaning. <laughs> you know, adhering to John Wesley's mantra that, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness. It's, it's the source of her behaviour, her attitude and her values rather than how many times did she go to church? Did she pray on a Sunday? Did she ever mention God? That's a rather obvious and I think almost kind of post-Christian understanding of faith. I'm going for a much broader concept. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Philby, for a, a tremendous uh, discussion, uh, a terrific lecture, and um, a, a great deal of food for thought there, I think, in. Uh, in, in your insights into Margaret Thatcher's uh, uh, faith and, uh, and a key aspect of what drove her life and, and career. So thank you very much, uh, Eliza, for joining us uh, today. And thank you to everybody for joining us here at the Heritage Foundation uh, for uh, today's lecture. And I hope you will join us again for uh, our future events and uh, hope you have a, a terrific week. Thank you.